one uh, piece on the classical guitar, which is considered to be perhaps the one piece that most guitar players tackle when they uh, start off with the classical guitar. It's a very good piece to be used as a work band so because of the fact that all the technical challenges for the uh, aspiring guitarist and for the instructor are very well laid off so as to be able to make it very clear from a technical point of view and of course from a musical point of view. The piece we're going to work together and we're going to use as a workbench for uh, understanding the technique, classical guitar technique in depth and also and especially the so-called Carnevaro approach to technique is going to be a piece which is officially anonymous, in other words, we don't know who composed it, although there is a different uh, speculations uh, with regards to who could the composer be. Even Brahms has been brought up as the possible composer for the piece. The piece is a piece known uh, nor generally as uh, Romance, um, a Romanza in Spanish, or even uh, Giochi Proibiti in Italy which is the country where the, where the film was very much in vogue in the late 60s. The piece is an arpeggio. Arpeggio comes from the word harp. The harp is that instrument that you probably have seen, which is played with ten fingers and which has a characteristic to it, which is mostly arpeggiated. In other words, the fingers go through a sequence of notes which are played in uh, one after the other in a subsequent uh, um, uh, evolution and not so much in a chord fashion. That's where the word arpeggio comes from, the harp. So arpeggio, inspired in the harp, is the main technique that is present in uh, romance. Now, when we look at a classical guitarist playing, we usually think of his fingers when it comes to literally pulling the strings with the right hand, in my case I'm a right-handed player, and with stopping with the left hand fingers the notes on the fingerboard when it comes to uh, stopping the notes on the fingerboard. And so we think about fingers when we think about guitar playing, when in fact that is more like a distortion of reality. The truth of the matter is that a guitarist plays with his whole body. Both the feet and the, the lower part of the torso and the upper part of the torso, the, the, the forearm, the, the elbow, the, the wrist, the, the whole body, body is involved in the, in the production of sound to the point that uh, the traditional school of guitar never really talked in, that ter in terms of fingers but more in terms of body. So both the way you present or you hold the instrument on your lap when you play and the way you, uh, you attack uh, the strings, both factors have to do with your body and not only with the fingers. The fingers ought to be seen as what they really are, which is the final part, the end part of a much larger um, uh, whole. Okay. So first of all, once you've decided what's going to be your best sitting position, and sitting position is undoubtedly crucial. In the classical guitar, we use what is usually called the classical sitting position, and what is classical about it is simply the fact that when guitarists decided to tackle much more sophisticated repertoire, they came to realize that the the popular way of sitting, which was usually on the right leg in a more relaxed or laissez-faire fashion, was not really apt for the more sophisticated uh, repertoire that guitarists were beginning to face. So usually what you have is a guitar which must be placed in a way that it wa works well in conjunction with your body. And so let's go one step at a time. The first thing you gotta keep in mind is when you sit with the classical guitar and you are tackling or you're wanting to learn the classical repertoire, you're dealing with music that's gonna require many minutes, not to say many hours, throughout a very long stretch of time to improve and to see the results uh, beginning to appear in your technique. Therefore, the accumulation or the summing up of many, many hours of practice is going to be required in order to see uh, an improvement in your technique. 
Therefore, it, your sitting position must be thought in terms of something which is going to be working with you in order not to hurt your lower back, your upper torso, and of course your arms as you play and you sum up the hours towards the perfecting classical guitar. So the classical uh, position for playing is thought in those terms, in terms of long-term learning which allows for long stretches of time sitting down with the guitar without injuring your body, okay? So how w would we approach the classical guitar position when you sit down? Because the arpeggio we're gonna tackle is definitely based on how you sit. Because the way you sit is gonna influence the way you place the instrument on your lap, and the way you uh, place the instrument on your lap is gonna influence the way you attack the strings with both hands. Therefore, you realize that sound is eventually the summing up of all the uh, antecedent factors, okay? So, as you lift your la uh, left leg on a stool, which is something we do in order not to have to bend down on the instrument in order to reach the instrument, what we do is we lift the guitar. So we, that's the reason we, use, we typically use a, a footstool. This is the the traditional approach, of course, nowadays different uh, systems have been brought into the scene and uh, every guitarist has the total freedom to choose which one he considers most uh, appropriate to, to, uh, for the job. I personally have been uh, so long exposed to the, to the footstool and the teachers that I had helped me to counterbalance the negative effects of the food stool in a way that I didn't need to incorporate uh, further, uh, uh, um, further uh, tools in order to achieve the same goal. So once you lift the food up on the stool, one thing is gonna happen, you're gonna be pulling your, your, your lower back backwards. And the way you compensate for the pulling back of the foot sitting on the food stool is you bring your right foot backwards like that. So you, in a way, bring your right foot backwards and you're, in a way, balancing out the backward pull of your, or a push of your left, of your left leg backward with your right leg. And you're feeling like your lower back is holding no strength whatsoever. In other words, I'm not mounting up any tension in my lower back, which is definitely one of the most sensitive areas to stress when playing. Once I decided that I'm going to sit in this position, the other thing I came to realize with the help of my teachers is that the classical guitar is uh, definitely an instrument which is, the, which is imported in the classical realm when it really was born in the popular flamenco realm. And the way flamenco players are used to play is totally different as an approach to what we classical players use. Therefore, the uh, typical uh, curve of the guitar that one uh, typically thinks that is meant to, in a way, fit your upper, uh, the part of your leg where the, the guitar typically rests, is not really meant to be used in that fashion because players that have tried to do that and actually have gone into doing that have had to twist their torso in a way to reach towards the upper frets of the classical guitar exercising a lot of strain on the lower back once again, which in the long, medium run has brought problems to the back. Therefore, adapting the body to the classical guitar is not the correct approach. The wise approach is to adapt the classical guitar to the body, and that's where my little cushion comes in handy. This could be something as uh, simple as a sponge. Actually, I started off with a sponge. One of my, my grandmother, back uh, some 30 years ago, handcrafted this for me. This basically is a sponge which she covered in velvet and she made a brown one for when I use brown clothing and a black one when I use a more dark uh, or a tuxedo for concerts. And it's basically a sponge which is uh, covered in velvet. So what I do with that is I place it on my leg. The sponge is a very good um, a break. You know, in other words, what it does, it restrains the guitar from slipping and it allows me to place it at an angle, which is more imagined as if I were pointing the guitar forward and slightly forward and as slightly uh, as slightly upwards. This is really the the way I'm uh, I'm placing the guitar. So the guitar is no longer perpendicular to my leg. It's more like at an angle, approximately 45 degree angle. 
Now, this is, in my opinion, in, and of course, after having examined alternatives and actually having tried some of them for many years, this is the approach I've come to. And in my late 50s, I can tell you that I can stay sit with a guitar for long stretches of time without feeling any strain in my lower and upper body. So I can recommend it, of course, to those people who find it convincing to them. Are other approaches also viable? Of course they are. And I have friends who use all different types of approaches and you're definitely welcome to explore into that. Now, once you play the, place the guitar, the other thing you want to keep in mind is that the sound you want to be projected upwards. In other words, if the guitar is pointing downwards, it tends to point the sound downwards, which means, in other words, that the sound is going to get as far as it would go if you pointed it slightly upwards. So it's just a, something which is more inviting for the sound to be projected upwards. And the other thing, the other reason for which I like my guitar to be pointing upwards is that I get a good view of the six strings instead of just watching or seeing the upper, the sixth string and the upper part of the frets, which is also a valid approach, which is used by many guitarists, especially from my antecedent classical guitarist generation. And I mean, people like Christopher Parkin or John Williams, they use this type of approach. Well, this new approach is more uh, uh, belonging to my generation, although it was uh, presented by players such as uh, Abel Carrevaro, Alvaro Pieri, and the like. So the, the guitar pointing upwards with a view to the six strings is more the approach that I have uh, uh, taken for me and which of course I recommend to my students. Now, once you have the guitar placed in uh, this manner, you will feel that the cushion here keeps it pretty much steady on the leg. At the same time, my arm as it rests on the upper part of the body keeps the instrument uh, stable. Therefore, this point, this point here in my thigh and this point here on the upper ring, in the upper lower ring, keeps the guitar steady, keeps the guitar in place. I don't need my left hand to do anything in order for the guitar to stay in place. The left hand, in fact, only starts getting the action once I start playing, and that's uh, got to be its main and only work during performance, okay? Now, Romance, the piece we're gonna play is, as I was saying earlier, an, ar an arpeggio. What an arpeggio is, is a sequence of notes. And the best way for you to understand how this piece works is to really illustrate it in a way that you can really understand it at an intellectual level. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use a comparison. I'm going to compare the right hand of the guitarist to a little a rock band so that you understand the role of each one of the fingers in the right hand. Think the Beatles. And when I say the Beatles, I mean, imagine that your A finger is the first, the lead guitar. In other words, in the Beatles, that role belonged to John Lennon. John Lennon would be playing the first string. The first guitar, the main guitar, the lead guitar. That's the role play of the first string, mainly, and of course of the A finger in the right hand, especially during the arpeggio. The, the next uh, and very important uh, member of that group was uh, the second guitar, which was uh, performed by George Harrison. George Harrison performed the second guitar. And uh, that role is uh, exercised by the fingers, middle finger and index finger. The right hand fingers are named by their name letters. In other words, the A finger, the ring finger, is uh, named after its uh, name letter, which is the A, the middle finger by the M, and the index finger by the I, and the thumb with the, by the P, which comes from uh, pollice, which is the thumb in Italian. So being a man cat, nomenclature in the music realm taken from Italian, that's why we use the P. Now, so going back to our member, George Harrison, he used to play the, the, the accompanying guitar, the second guitar, the rhythm guitar, and that's performed by the middle and index finger in the right hand, and the role in the piece we're going to play, Romance, is in the second and third string. So George Harrison would be performing these two notes. When you put both the John Lennon and George Harrison to work, in other words, the main melody with the eight fingers, finger and the middle and, uh, and the index finger to work out the second string, in other words, George Harrison, working in conjunction with John Lennon, you get... This 
easy is the basic part of an arpeggio. Now this sequence, as you can notice, is very evened out. The sound is, so to say, a neutral sound. That's, a, so to say, your home base sound. One sound that you cannot really point in any particular direction. It's not metallic, like... Uh, and it's not too soft as... It's uh, somewhere in the middle, and it's your standard guitar sound. And you ought to have your own very intimate uh, standard sound for overall playing. And arpeggio, of course, is one of those scenarios. So you have now Ruben, of course, one of the great survivors is uh, Paul, uh, Paul McCartney, and he plays the bass. The bass is what creates the, the harmonic sustain for whatever happens on top. In other words, whatever John Lennon does and George Harrison does with the second guitar is much more sustained by what uh, Paul McCartney does on the bass. And that's performed with a thumb on the sixth, fifth, and fourth string, respectively, beginning with the sixth string. So you hear... And rhythmically speaking, at the command of the uh, Ringo Starr on the drums, that that intervention of the sixth string, the bass, is uh, that it's performed every four beats. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So the bass is performed every four beats. So the arpeggio, to look at it at an ensemble level so that you understand the role of each one of these voices, because that's what they are. They are different voices. It's to be seen like, like this. You start off with the bass and the first guitar playing at the same time. The way you do that is you plot both the sixth and the first string, strings are counted from the bottom up. You pluck both of them in the way of you would uh, be uh, plucking or pressing a uh, plier. In other words, you, you make this type of motion as you were uh, getting something with a plier like that. That's the motion you perform. You get in contact with the string you're going to pluck. In other words, your thumb rests on the sixth string. The word that is being used since the 1980s for this uh, feeling of the strings is also a word which is called planting. Planting the thumb on the sixth string. I also like to call it feeling the strings. Feeling the strings with the tip, tip of your finger, fingers is the way your right hand fingers see the strings. They feel it. Like a blind players, players deal with guitar playing, they feel the strings. Many violin players also use the feeling approach. They don't really rely on sight, they rely more on feeling more than on sight. Therefore, feel the string with your thumb, feel the first string with your A finger, and when I say feel, I mean literally feel it with the tip of your finger, of your fingers. So you kind of literally go like that, you really feel the, the, the string with your, with the flesh, and once you feel it, you squeeze it a little bit, and then you release the tension, and you produce the sound. You'll have to practice this throughout the day today in order to get the sound that you desire. I'm just uh, illustrating to you the concepts that you have to understand, first of all, and take to an intellectual level from your brain to your fingers to be transformed into what musicians typically call muscular memory, the memory that your muscles uh, go developing as you practice. Because we both count on the same elements for guitar learning, which are time and patience. These are the two essential elements that we need to become proficient with a musical instrument. And we both can benefit from both time and patience. And neither of us can really progress in guitar or instrumental playing unless we count on these two essential elements, okay? So, once we decided that we understood the, how the plucking is gonna happen, we insert the second guitar, performed, remember, by George Harrison, playing the second and third string in succession. We go like... And per, just prior to producing the sound, we also feel the string for a split second prior to actually plucking the string. So we feel the second string, and then we produce the sound. We feel the third string and then we pull it and we feel the sound. So, 
the whole arpeggio sequence looks a little bit like Have you noticed how the bass pops in every so many beats? Look, one, two, three, on the fourth beat, bass, two, three, on the fourth beat, two, three, bass, two, three, bass. This is an arpeggio, the, the basic arpeggio present in romance that you have to master. And I recommend you master it separately. Work in other words, your right hand first, and then you incorporate your left hand. Why? Because unlike pianists, I use pianists as a good example, who use their hands in total independence. In other words, they play one uh, thing with their hand and do a totally different melody with their left hand. In other words, they are like two different persons using one hand and the other. The guitar player works with the two hands working in conjunction in the production of a single sound. In other words, the, the two hands are synchronized to produce music. This is typical of the classical guitar. And the other characteristic of the classical guitar is that unlike uh, the um, pianists who put both their palms, the palms of their hands facing upwards, classical guitars use the right hand with the palm facing upwards and the left hand with the palm of their hands facing downwards. In other words, their hands are inverted and that generates a whole different setup for the neurons and the synapses that are created by your brain. This is so that you're aware. It's always important that you're aware of what you're really doing and how much is really happening as you are simply playing the guitar, okay? Now, going forward, once you practice, and this is part of your work today until we move on to the next lesson tomorrow probably, you have to master your right hand fluidity uh, for a few minutes, mounting them up with a metronome if possible, keeping rhythm steady, and most of all, and above all things, your sound must be regular, round, and of course, beautiful. Musicians are all about sound. Just as painters are about color, we are about sound. And sound must be beautiful, otherwise our music, no matter how fast or how sophisticated what we play is, if our sound is not beautiful, our music will not be beautiful. Therefore, your arpeggio must sound first and most foremost beautiful. Once you keep it going, which takes a few minutes, I'm sure that by the end of the day, if you can mount up about an hour of practice, your arpeggio will get up to level, where it sounds very similar to this. All right, now the next thing I want you guys to realize is that the arpeggio, although it sounds very evened out, it really is not. In other words, the first guitar is called the first guitar for a reason. And that reason is that it's leading the melody. It's uh, taking a, a leading role in what the music performed is doing. Therefore, the sound it's producing ought to be, in a way, on top of the rest. So what I'm doing, really, is I'm adding a little accent on the first string, on the A finger. And the way I achieve that is by simply stiffening the A finger a little bit more than the rest of the fingers in the right hand. This, of course, requires a lot of attention and very slow work of your fingers as you begin your workout sessions. In other words, you want to think the A finger slightly more tense than the rest of the fingers in order to produce a louder sound. So we get... The reason I do that is because the lead guitar is going to be leading the melody, which is going to be... And 
that melody must be always keeping center stage in my performance. Now, the traditional approach, but I would consider it the wrong approach if you do not use it wisely, is that the, the traditional school or the old timers school that I have been of course also very much influenced by uses the rest stroke to bring out notes as if the right hand can only use the rest stroke to bring out notes and that is a mistake because every time you want to use the rest stroke you must change the presentation of your right hand on the strings and that's something you want to avoid at all costs unless you're looking for a special effect which as the word says ought to be used as something special a special effect rest stroke in the contemporary uh, classical guitar world is a special effect and it's not overused or abused as it was back in the days when uh, John Williams and uh, Christopher Parking and Andres Segovia were paving the way for us guitarists. So uh, people like Carlevaro, Jose Tomas and the Romeros have introduced other ways of doing things with your hands which of course don't uh, don't dis don't disregard or look down on the past. Of, on the contrary, we pretty much uh, cherish it, but we uh, uh, complement it with the contemporary approaches, which also have a lot of wisdom attached to them. So, the rest stroke, which is of course a viable option, would look at the same scenario, doing something like. But of course, I've uh, opted for the other approach, which keeps the right hand uh, free. And of course, whenever you use the rest approach, what you're doing, you're stopping the, the string uh, on top of it, and you're killing the sound altogether. That's why it's not always musically a wise option. And your decisions ought to always be, more than anything, musical. So when it comes to bringing out sounds, it's a matter of more of anything than bringing more stiffening a term which was coined by Abel Carlevaro, and he called it in Spanish fijación, which means fixation. Imagine that you're using like a calf or you're, yeah, you're bending, you're, you're stiffening your finger in a way that it's not as flexible as, say, the other two fingers. And so becoming more stiff, it produces a more, a more protruding sound. That's my approach. And that's the, the, the approach I propose to you. So once you get this arpeggio going with the first string protruding, then you start working with your left hand. So our right hand, just look at it, it's always kept very much relaxed in this fashion. There is no tension whatsoever. My body, as I was pointing to you, is kept uh, balanced by one leg up and one leg backward pushing forward. My guitar is well placed, there's no tension in my lower back. My forearm rests on the guitar. The guitar is well placed facing forward and upwards with the cushion I use on my leg. And now I introduce my left hand, my, my stopping apparatus here on the fingerboard. The same approach, approach for the left hand. Same relaxed state, just as this one, but with the palm facing downwards. My fingers ought to be always relaxed like that. The thumb is hidden behind the fingerboard, and classical guitarists very seldom show you the face of their thumb on the top part of the fingerboard, because typically when they do that, they're either trying to relax, or they're using their thumb for some special effect. But normally, their left hand thumb is invisible to the, hand, to the, to the people watching them from the front. I am the only one who sees the thumb because I'm looking at my hand from above. Now, the hand is relaxed in this position and that's the way you ought to keep it in your, so to say, relaxed mode. Now, what the left hand does, it stops, it makes the, left, the strings shorter or longer depending where you stop the string. So you make the sounds higher or lower depending on where you stop. The first string is named E, or Mi in Spanish, or in, in uh, Latin-speaking countries, Italian, of course, is one of them. And E is the name of the first string, and just so that you know, it's the same name as the sixth string. The first and the sixth string have the same name, they're both called E. And that's why when you pay, play them both together, they, sang, they, they both sound in unison, like a big E. 
they go well together because they are the same note. Only that one is much lower and one is, mu is much higher. You will discover that romance, the piece we're playing, has even another and a higher one down here on the 12th fret, which is also an E, and it's here. So you have very high E, a middle E, and a very low E. Okay, these are all E's on the sixth string, on the first string, on the first string, on the seventh fret, and on the first string on the twelfth fret. These are all E's. Okay, so what you do, you start off with an B. And B is on the first string on the seventh fret. You keep your hand very relaxed, and the only finger that applies a little pressure is the fourth, is finger four. Unlike your right hand where you call the fingers by their name, on the left hand you call the fingers by their number. The index finger is finger one, the middle finger is finger two, the A finger is finger three, and the fourth finger is the little finger is finger four. So you use finger four to stop the B on the first string with a little pressure, just enough pressure to squeeze the string on the seventh fret without applying more than enough pressure. In other words, your thumb is not to be used to squeeze just as an opposing thumb. In other words, it gives you a sense of direction, a sense of equilibrium to the left hand, and it's not meant to squeeze. Only very seldom does your thumb participate in the squeezing, but it ought to be used very seldom. Otherwise, you're going to be mounting up tension and you're never going to be able to play fluently, fast, or in a way which is relaxed. And when you're not relaxed, you're going to sound stiff or tense, and you want to avoid that at all costs. Now, Stopping the B is just what I said, squeezing softly the first string on the, on the seventh fret. And as you do that, you perform the whole arpeggio sequence with the right hand. Please look and observe how relaxed I look. I'm really not feeling more tension than the little tension it requires to stop the beat. My right hand is totally in its neutral, totally relaxed position, and everything in my left hand is totally relaxed with the exception of the little finger, finger four. So tension is, must always be checked. You must, be, must perform a tension check every few seconds. Just check, am I relaxed? Yes. Do I feel tension anywhere in my body? Yes, then compensate for it by annulling it. So again, Little tension in finger four to press on the B, and then. You will notice that the only scenarios where tension will build up is when you start pushing yourself in order to play faster than you can. In other words, if you want to play this faster, like you're gonna feel so pushed to do it that you're probably gonna Stiffen up your upper torso, you're going to stiffen your right hand, you're going to stiffen your left hand, and you're going to start playing tension. So, remove speed, play at a speed where tension is totally taken care of, and you can perform everything without any tension and any mistake to show up. So, you play very slowly, keeping sound always as your main goal. You want a clean sound. And today's goal what you have to achieve by the end of today is to play the first sequence of romance like I'm showing you with no tension, with this clarity of sound, with the first string protruding above all other strings, and with the evenness of sound that I've shown you from the beginning. So this is your objective for today and I'm going to do it for you. Do it once again. I want to show you something so that you realize the difference between one approach and the other. By simply changing the angle of attack, the angle of attack means the way I attack the strings. If at a right angle, if at a 45 degrees angle, that, that's what I refer to when I, when I say the angle of attack. Depending on slight changes on the angle of attack and to the placing of my right hand around and on the sound hole, that's where I and how I generate the type of sound that I, that I produce. In other words, playing here 
is where I perform and I, re and I can get the sound that I'm producing. Changing the angle of attack slightly would produ produce a different sound. Check it out, look. Simply changing this angle. This is one tool that we musicians use, just like painters don't only have green, they have different shades of green. We guitarists have different shades of sound to play with. Therefore, you do realize now how important the angle of attack is when performing and how you must keep it. So one thing I invite you to do is that as you perform your arpeggio, you also introduce your right hand to different angles of attack so that you can introduce your hand to different sounds. So you can and you ought to be trying to produce both and both things ought to be performed by you without any effort. And of course, it's the only effort that I'm going to be requesting that you implement is your time and your patience in achieving the goal. I think we have it pretty much nailed out. I'll resume it in a nutshell. Sitting position is very important. The left leg, leg goes up, the right leg goes a little bit backward to even out the tension in the lower back part of your body, so as you don't get to suffer from lower back pain. The guitar is placed at an angle, pointing forward and upward a little bit, so that your the head of the guitar is never too far, so you don't have to reach out to the nose kind of in the neighborhood all the time. Your hands must rest very relaxed both on the right side and on the left side. They're, both the fingers are relaxed and they only get to work when you're playing notes. And remember sound is king. We musicians are all about sound. And your objective for the end of today until the next lesson which probably will be either later on today depends on my schedule which I will check later on or Tomorrow, nevertheless, you will still find the lesson here on my channel. And I invite you, of course, to subscribe. And of course, you can find all the accompanying material of what I'm doing on my website, mangore.com. Mangore is the name of the most fam famous Paraguayan musician. I'm here from Paraguay. And mangore.com is my website, mangore.com. And you'll find the score, the videos for uh, this piece for romance online. They're all free of charge so you can benefit from them at no charge. Of course, you can also subscribe and access the rest of the transcriptions that I offer at, a, at an annual subscription, and I invite you to do that as well. But uh, for the end of today, you ought to be able to play romance, both as a very sweet melody and as a more a poignant metallic melody. So again, I'll show you. This flexibility that I'm showing you, I want you guys to acquire because only a fraction of guitarists in the world have it mastered out. And the sooner you incorporate it in your technique, the better it is. Therefore, you will see that the, our workbench, Romance, is the perfect scenario to introduce classical guitar technique and, of course, a very beautiful piece of music. I'll see you guys later today or tomorrow. And I thank you and may God bless you all. Thank you for your company. Bye-bye.